Welcome to a special edition of Anglican Unscripted, the Christmas Eve edition 560. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and it is indeed the 24th of December, and you should be very grateful I didn't become orthodox or be squabbling about whether it was Christmas Eve or not. You got off lightly. And indeed, it is a special episode. Now, it's going to be a crazy episode. First, I don't know if you guys know this. George hasn't posted any pictures, but Susan has. They have a new puppy. The puppy has a voracious appetite and ate through the microphone cables that uh, George uses for his uh, connection to the Wirecast here. So he's just using his little tinny sounding laptop. I have traveled afar and I'm in a hotel room here in Madison, Wisconsin, visiting my mom and dad for Christmas. Uh, uh, the family's all coming here for tomorrow to have a, a feast this joyous uh, event where we open presents, which we probably don't need, and mom is going to buy me some more t-shirts. She loves to buy me t-shirts. It's her favorite thing. Gavin, I saw your daughter going around in the background in the pre-show. Uh, who's all at the Gavin residence this, this coming well, week? Well, there's just, just the three of us now. We had some extended family here mm -hmm. for the last couple of days, and that's been very exciting. But there's always a competition at Christmas as to who spends the day, where and when. And uh, so um, uh, we're, we've done quite well so far. I think it was a <clears throat> very wise of, of God to have the major manger scene is part of our uh, uh, understanding of Christmas, the, the chaos of Christmas, and I think that helps with uh, how families travel around and try and get together, knowing that it started with chaos and it, it will not end in chaos. Uh, let's move on a little bit to the news. Before we do that, I do something important in the pre-show. Yes, it's my job to tell you to like the show. You can like it anytime that you get to something you like that we said. Just click the like button on Facebook or YouTube. It has a little representation with a thumb up there. You see that at the bottom screen. Just like the program because it tells the algorithms at Facebook and YouTube that we're cool. We know we're cool, but we need Facebook to know we're cool. And you need to share the program. You copy that hyperlink or you click the share button. Send it to your friends and enemies and people you think might want to be Anglican. That's, that's important. Also, the show continues in the comments. Uh, we had an episode with some 300 comments. That's what we expect because we have the smartest audience any theological show could ever want. And you're there to provide extra information, to continue the conversation, or to correct us. Yes, George? <laughs> well, Kevin, I just think that you're the William F. Buckley of Anglicanism, with the uh, dry okay. wit of every edition. Uh, of course, yes. I need a cigar, but yeah, I, I, or he was a pipe guy. And I, and I think I'd like to also to say that, that I have developed a whole load of new friends and a whole load of new enemies. <laughs> so, <laughs> you talk casually about friends and enemies. Actually, it's not so casual anymore. My, my whole landscape has changed. New ones of both. <laughs> And Gavin, yeah. you haven't even included the enemies you're going to make during this show's broadcast. That's right. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Fresh every day. <laughs> Fresh every day. Yikes. And no, I mean, yeah, there's a, a, a video on timemagazine.com where this lady who's a sensible liberal uh, comes out and says, you know, it's all right to offend people. You know, part of the greatest political conversations we had were not being afraid to offend people. And you go back to Douglas Lincoln, uh, you know, talks. Those were pretty rough to, to listen to. So let's get on I'm, to I'm having I'm having such trouble not being offended. One or two people have written to me saying, I have these books which I might send you to make you change your mind. And I'm trying to think, how on earth do I reply? And because I, I'm, I'm thinking, do you think I'm so stupid that I haven't given this as much thought, as much time, as, you know, am I uneducated? Have I not... Have I not spent 20 years in it? I'll send you two books to make you change your mind. Well, hold on a second. I, I, got it, I got an email that said, currently, Gavin is the only one in all of Britain to Brexit. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, uh, yes, in the spirit, I, do you know I hadn't even seen that this was the spirit of Brexit. I, that's, that's you, 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 you've Brexited. I guess we call it. You were chaplain, so we a checks it. I'm not sure. Well, we'd I, have to I, find. I Brexited it. early. 
Kevin, if I could offer some advice, I would say that uh, I would be very. Oh, George, fun. don't, 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 <laughs> don't offer advice, George. Make, <laughs> the, come on, let's do conversation, not advice. Yeah, conversation. Yeah, sure, 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 conversation. Okay, the conversation would be: people care enough about you to want to try to help you according yes. to their lives. Yeah, that, that, that's true, George. I, I, yeah. I just wish they they cared with a, a bit more respect. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, no, no, yeah, that's actually, it doesn't yeah, sound. That doesn't yeah, sound. What I, meant, what I meant was. Now, now Karen, I, there have been many times in my life when I've wanted to say to my adult children, begin the conversation by being, how could you be so damn stupid? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's it. Thank you very yeah. much. Those and are the words <laughs> that are dripping off my lips. The people who are writing to you are trying to not say, how could you be so damn stupid? Rather, they're and trying to say it. It, uh, last weekend, I got a call from one of my daughters saying, Daddy, I want to drive to San Sacramento from Los Angeles and buy an electric car because electric cars are the new thing. And I was tempted to say, how could you be so damn stupid and lay out all the reasons, send her all the literature why electric cars, unless you have a garage like Kevin with your own charger, are not a smart thing to do. Instead, I said, well, Bonnie, I'm so happy that you're thinking along these lines. Why don't you see how much it'll cost to get insurance now in California so you can pay your own car insurance? Well, we heard no more of it after that. So if you respond to people with misdirection and kindness, I think you'll feel much better about the decision you've made. Yeah, for, for a lot of people, you, you got the, the big tattoo on your arm that says, uh, I love Jenny or whoever. And uh, they're like sending you advice on how to get the tattoo removed. Okay. I, I've, ju I've just been to confession. Father's uh, absolved me, given me a penance and some good spiritual direction. Penance, George, that was penance. magnificent. I heard every word. Thank you very much. <laughs> the words, right. how could you be so damn stupid, will not pass my lips. <laughs> On to that. Okay, but it is okay to think that. It's okay to think that because we're dealing with a fallen world. Sure. With with a high proportion of stupid people. Why do you think the Episcopal Church is still around? Why do you think I have a well, daughter? Uh, <laughs> and sometimes we're, we're part of those stupid people ourselves. I agree. We, yes, we, we are. We get to report and participate in stupidity. That's the magic in of Anglican. Yes, that's, right. that's the magic yes. of Anglican Unscripted. Let's uh, what a great transition to some of the news out there. Uh, there is still a chaotic follow up uh, to the Christianity Today story where the uh, uh, editor, Mark Golley, uh, wrote his Dump Trump uh, editorial. I love the response by so many different uh, evangelical organizations. Some didn't write a, uh, a very good response, but I think James Dobson wrote the Kevinist response. Basically, his response was, who else? Of, of the election last year, who were we going to choose? Hillary? Who are we going to choose now? Okay, give, me, give me a person who, who is um, going to uh, protect Christianity in any realm of, from these candidates. And I think we're still in that, that position. Yeah, Trump sucks in character flaws, but he's doing good in some uh, important areas for the American ideal and for the, the, the Christian ideal. Kevin, I, I agree with almost all that you say, but I would stop because everybody sucks and everybody has character flaws. Well, and I know. So I, I, don't, I don't want to uh, paint and that there is that. See, there's such an American, there's a problem with an evangelicalism and in the United States, as mm -hmm. across the world, of semi deifying leaders, of basically saying that our leaders have no feet of clay, our leaders are perfect, we can't say anything bad about them. And, you know, I don't want to get into that with Donald Trump. He has good qualities, he has bad qualities, as does every other human being. For me, the problem is pointing out his bad qualities without knowing the state of his soul and the state of his mind. Indeed, and I want to take this further, he has many character flaws, we all do. Who would be worthy to be president of America? Nobody. Nobody's worthy to be president. That's something that's uh, given to you, and you have to live into the role. He's living well, into the, the role uh, as a person of, uh, in an administrative fashion, but uh, Trump on Twitter is a disaster, in my humble opinion. And so, you know, yeah, opinion, Trump is the master of Twitter. There's nobody who does what he does better. Mm -hmm. Trump is the consummate man from Queens, and if you and part of this is regional 
regional expectations of what is polite and good behavior. Donald Trump is not from the Midwest. He's not from California. He's, he is what he is, a man from Queens with that mo attitude and mindset. And some people find him extraordinarily vulgar. Others find him extraordinarily entertaining. But I don't think that's a uh, cause for moral censure or outrage. <laughs> We may find ourselves talking about how you assess holiness later on in the show, but <laughs> one of the things that's quite clear is that God can use morally flawed people. And one of the examples of that is Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson, who's a morally flawed people, and he, he was, uh, there's a lovely clip going around by a woman on the election trail saying, look, look at my child, he's very like you. Actually, you could be his love father. <laughs> he, he could be your love child, whatever, and a huge embarrassment. Um, so Boris Johnson is, is not the world's most moral man, but he's done two amazingly important things in the last 48 hours. He's released two videos. One was to the Jewish people on the, to celebrate Hanukkah. And, and with expertise, with theological expertise and information, uh, at a level of insight and emotional commitment, he's talked about how valuable the Jewish people are in the country and how welcome they are and how important they are. And then he's released another one saying how important it is to remember how, the, how Christians are persecuted all around the world. Now, I don't remember a, a prime minister in my lifetime who's made that, that kind of a stand. So here we have a man with a highly disordered sex life, um, absolutely open for criticism from uh, anybody who wants to exercise um, uh, that kind of critique. But I think uh, doing God's work you know, in two enormously important ways in a way that, that, that other people couldn't do and it seems unconnected with his own inner moral virtue so we we may have to consider what things are and what things aren't connected with the inner moral virtue but most of us fortunately realize um, that not only are we amongst the stupid but we're amongst the flawed and god uses us anyway i think it's called grace in the protestant tradition well, it doesn't take too much, and I know George is certainly a, a Christian historian, and you yourself are, to look at the Old Testament and look at the leaders God raised up and God found favor with to put them in charge of things. And you think, you know, Trump is just an amateur in their uh, professionally flawed worlds. Uh, you you may have you may have come across it before, but one of the things that people sometimes clergy sometimes do if there's a issues of public morality at Christmas is they go through the moral virtues of the genealogy of Jesus, and uh, you find some some uh, people who make Trump look quite holy. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I just you know I I, I I don't want to take that out, out on the limb too far, but uh, we as a, uh, a created people have a, a very rich history. Uh, being led by flawed people sometimes well and sometimes poorly and we'll have to uh, see how that works here with Trump. Part of the uh, thing that I like about this is that I look at the number of views each story generates and for some strange reason the Christmas message from the Archbishop of uh, uh, Hong Kong has generated uh, well the, the story about uh, Donald Trump Christianity Today has a thousand times more views than the Christmas message of the Archbishop of Hong Kong. So there's something in this for me for uh, stoking the fires as long as I can from a publication point of view, that this is pure gold. Uh, Christianity Today has doubled down. Uh, other Christian leaders have come back, 200, 200 evangelical leaders have penned an open letter, more people are adding their names to it. Charisma Magazine has laid, laid into them. Uh, a former editor of Christianity Today has saying the current editor, Mark Galley, current for another week, has betrayed the foundations of Christianity Today, which is not to do politics, but to do the work of the gospel. Um, so this is a great ongoing story. It's just wonderful. And we don't have to take an opinion because people, we, we I posted this on the ACNA Facebook page because Mark Galley is a member of the I think it's the Church of the Resurrection in Wheaton, in Illinois. Wheaton, yeah. Correct. Will be corrected by those who can tell us better. He's a lay member of that congregation. Mm -hmm. So there is an ACNA angle, and many of the editors and leaders of Christianity Today are members of the ACNA. So there's a hook there. That store, that post has gotten over 500 comments. Uh, and you should see the blood in the streets between people 
who are defending Trump to the death and uh, never Trumpers and oh you're just a closet Hillary fan well she's never committed adultery uh, <laughs> now, on one hand this is terrible but on the other hand this is wonderful this is, uh, yeah. the the fodder with which journalists love every yes. so often we'll get some person saying why can't you do more good news stories why can't you put out stories about how wonderful the church is doing and about how the bake sale raised all this money to help poor orphans in africa yeah right Amazing. and we'll get two people to read it no you get two people to read it people to read donald <laughs> trump uh, and christianity today so unless you've got a lot of cousins who will click on the links of good news stories please don't tell me to post only sweet things okay now i need you guys both to put your seatbelts on okay we're going to talk theology we're going to transition into a story from the, the bethel church out in california where one of the the, the, uh, the pastors out there had a daughter who died and she was two or three and um anybody who's lost a child uh, this may be triggering to you. Um, it's a tragic story. People lose children all the time. People lose unborn children all the time. There's miscarriages. It is something that sticks with you forever. And I think it's designed to. Um, losing a child is horrid. Um, and we just hope it draws you closer to, to God. So we're going to be talking about a story about people who reacted differently when their child died and wanted to resurrect her. And did that by in pressing upon their church to pray for this child's resurrection, to raise money for this child's resurrection. Um, and this is getting social media play because this is exactly what the liberals in uh, the, the Twitter world think we do all the time. And they use it as a great example. See, there is no God because he didn't resurrect this, this daughter of pastors, holy people, uh, if ever there were any. And this is a great time to talk about stuff like this, Christmas time, when we have something given to us, the greatest hope uh, ever delivered in, in gift form. So let's talk a little bit about the theology of resurrection amongst the, the dead children. George, you've certainly read this story. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, what am I missing in, in my, my direction of the story there? Well, I'll just flesh it out a bit, but you've got the story right. Bethel Church in Redding, California. Uh, it's a mega church, very prominent in the, uh, what I would call name it and claim it, uh, gospel movement, neo-Pentecostal. Neo, yeah. They, uh, one of their pastors, the two-year-old child died, and they impressed upon all their members if you claim it, if you call upon the name of Jesus, your faith can move mountains. And this is going to be a test. This is going to be a sign to the world that Jesus is real and is God. Three days went past, and on the third day they said, this will be the day because, you know, three days, Christ rose from the tomb after three days. A week went past, and Bethel released a statement saying, it looks uh, like we're not praying hard enough, we're not working hard. In other words, we need to start off by saying this is not a fraud. This is, you read every so often of churches in Africa where they claim to resurrect somebody at their funeral and it's basically... A, it's a, a fraud, yeah. It's a fraud. <laughs> but these are, these are people who are sincere in their beliefs, but they are misguided and have been taught wrongly and don't have an understanding theology of death, of the theology of works, uh, from their perspective, you can earn your salvation, you can earn your healing, you can, from within the Protestant worldview, um, they come, they have rejected the salvation uh, by faith, placing in its place the salvation by works. So many prayers performed, so much money given, and if you're a good person, only good things will happen to you. Or the sign that this child is still dead is a sign in this worldview that the pastor is not a good pastor. And that's where I wanted to come out of. You know, in the pre-show I said, if you can't earn uh, your way to heaven, can you earn healing? And I wanted to go about this as the, the topic of holiness. Uh, do holy people get more favor uh, 
uh, from God in terms of uh, praying for healing and, and uh, other types of topics. And I know, Gavin, you're going to love this topic uh, in, in your newfound uh, uh, Roman Catholic freedom. Uh-huh. So uh, let, let's start with you on this. Uh, does holiness, holiness win you uh, spiritual gifts of favor? I'd like to start with addressing what George said earlier on, because it was a very, ca- not a casual remark, but he sure. said it briefly, I think it deserves expanding, and that was the Christian attitude to death. Um, we all, I mean, of course, the loss of, of a child, the loss of anybody is uh, the most terrible wrench, because we all do live in this world. But I think, I, 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 it seems to me that along with the awful grief and the, the, the terrible trauma, Christians in our culture don't manage to, to, to also live in heaven at the same time uh, we, until the, some considerable time has passed. Christian, Western Christianity has no theology of suffering. We do not know how to suffer, right. and, we've, and because we don't know how to suffer, we do not know how to grieve. I think that so that's a separate point. So, so yeah, but let's let's move on to that. That's very rich. In, uh, that's a very rich uh, area. So the. the and Kevin hasn't met my mother-in-law, so I think there's the hard <laughs> suffering. <laughs> so I, I think the first thing I want to say, the first thing I want to say about myself is that um, uh, investing ourselves in heaven as much as we invest ourselves in time and space is, is something that we often find we're not doing very well. So. Um, the fact is we are going to you know heaven is where we're going to end up this is this is transitional I think there's a great temptation as Christians to not treat our lives here as transitional but to treat them as as permanent that we want to be in control of if we move on to the business about I think there are, there are two things that the Protestant Church didn't help me very much with and I don't mean that critically maybe I I didn't pick it up very well but Kevin is absolutely right I was very surprised when I met a number of Catholics who talked about experiencing suffering as a form of reparation in other words suffering could be turned into something um almost transactional it's, it's, it's this exact almost transactional that nearly caused the reformation of course over over purgatory and indulgences but but there's such a delicate balance isn't there between saying there is no point in suffering at all and yet actually sometimes you can bear suffering for other people metaphysically charles williams one of whom c.s lewis absolutely adored looked at St. Paul and he read St. Paul to say that you could ask God to let you carry the sufferings of somebody else as an as an act of of, of mystical um, mystical love and engagement um, in the in the realm of the spirit and he believed it actually happened I, I think the business about about holiness is that I remember looking for books on holiness when I was a, when I was a, an Anglican seminarian. I found one, and it it, it didn't speak to me at all. Uh, but the reason the holiness matters is that within the Catholic tradition. It's certainly the case that um, if you're looking to, to to make a better bridge between ourselves and the will of God in our suffering, then one of the ways in which that bridge is strengthened is through the holiness of people. So miracles seem to happen more often amongst the holy. Um, now, it's, I think one should say straight away that, that the miracles that I've seen and I've been involved with myself have been unholy miracles. I remember when I led, laid hands on a, a drunk drag, drug addict in the East End and discovered six months later he'd been converted and had a most amazing testimony. I knew nothing about it. That was absolutely nothing to do with holiness. So there are, there are miracles that have nothing to do with holiness. But there are miracles that have to do with holiness. And that's one of the reasons why Christians got involved in relics because they thought that that matter had become holy. It was almost like matter is a sponge that absorbs the presence of God uh, and, and, and is not something entirely dualistic in the sense of, of the spirit and, and the flesh. So one of the things I think that, that we can try and take into account when we're looking for the miraculous is the extent to which our obedience to the will of God and our tuning into the will of God makes the will of God, from his point of view, easier to establish in our lives. I I certainly think there's some relationship between prayer, uh, receiving miraculous help, and the will of God, obedience and holiness. I agree and I disagree with Gavin. I don't share your views about relics or 
<laughs> I, I I must come out. I'm anti relic too. I'm an anti reliquer. Okay, I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have brought relics up. That was a terrible mistake. It's all going to be about relics now. <laughs> all I the comments for episode two six five sixty is relics. Well, let, let, when I say when I. I when I misbehave with my toenail clippings, I say to my family, you know, <laughs> you'll be grateful of these one day. <laughs> my, my experience is that uh, holiness has no relationship to suffering. Uh, I have known many, many holy people who have suffered profoundly in their lives. I've known many not-so-nice people who have had wonderful, pain-free lives. Uh, um, but I have seen suffering work in the lives of people for good. Um, so I'm, I'm not responding directly, and I don't want to talk about relics because that's that's a, a stale, yeah. that's a dead end. But I, th I think that the uh, I don't believe that uh, by any earthly effort of my own, I am able to advance my cause in heaven, because I believe what is sufficient is my faith in Jesus Christ. Now, in my life, and we, we covered this in an episode four or five years ago. Uh, Gavin, do you remember the episode where it's the first time I, I was out of, the, out of the nursing home, I still had my hard cervical collar on, the neck collar, and I, had, I was paralyzed. I, uh, uh, Susan had to place the mic on the table because I couldn't use my arms. I was in a wheelchair, and the uh, prognosis was that uh, this was going to be it. And I was still had parish responsibilities. And that weekend, Susan, I lay down flat in the back of our station wagon and was driven to the parish and was wheeled up. And I felt like the Pope because I sat in a wheelchair in front of the altar and people came up to me, received communion. Uh, they were going to kiss my hands or feet, I guess. But one of the things is that there was an older congregation in the countryside where up to that point, I had been a very good professional priest but most of the people here had bodily problems. You know, they soiled themselves, they were in wheelchairs, they knew that they stank, they knew they couldn't do what they could do. And through my suffering, I came to a deeper place of empathy with those people. So for my ministry as a priest, suffering has led me to a deeper relationship and understanding with Jesus Christ, such that I so think my experience is that the good priests that I know in the Episcopal Church and in many churches are those who bear and carry the burdens and sufferings of others. That's part of my ministry in life. Yes. In other words, this is not something that the uh, sanctified or the beatified have an exclusive title to. There are lots, you know, well, unless you're little sanctified, children, unless you're sanctified. little children's hymn. I sing a song in the saints of God, and one was a doctor, and one was a queen, and one was a shepherdess on the green. They're saints just like you and me, and God help me to be one too as the clothes. It's not. Okay, George, I, I'm not sure that you're. I'd like to. I'd like to say I don't think you've been. I, I, if I say you're not thinking straight, I don't mean how can you be so damn stupid. What I mean is, so many of the things you said are absolutely right, but I. But I'm not. Sh but, but I think the conclusion you drew was mistaken. You started off by saying there's no relationship between suffering and holiness, and you then drew a wonderful relationship. Yeah, I, between I, suffering I, I and think holiness. you said it wrong in the beginning. <laughs> No, no, there is no relationship between suffering and holiness such that the holy do not suffer. Okay, all right. Suffering. No, it's the other way around. It, it's the other way around. It's the, the holy suffer extraordinarily. And suffering. That's can, what I want to suffering say. Suffering can strengthen your soul, but it, it has nothing to do. It, let's look at this case out in California. These people are giving okay. until it hurts. They're putting their time and their emotional energy and, their, and everything they have into prayers, seeking God's favor for this child that it be resurrected. It's not going to happen because I don't believe God works in that way. And it's it's what we it's the prosperity gospel. It's you know remember the let's keep away from the faith. Prosperity gospel preachers in the ACNA that you know you can name and claim your uh, your salvation. I'm sorry, it just doesn't work that way according to my lights. Exactly. Let's keep away from faith and works for the moment and stick with what we know. And what we know is, in my experience, um, I, I have never, uh, the most progress I make in the Christian life coming close to God is because and when I've suffered. And I have, I have suffered 
some very as as I know you all have, we all our listeners have. I think there's a very close relationship between holiness and suffering. The more you suffer, the more God can can purge you and uh, purge me and to cleanse our will. One of the things we see is that amongst some of the most uh, the people with a reputation for holiness, they're the ones who've actually suffered most. So there's a strange kind of Christian lay reflex, I think, which is if God loves me, uh, I won't suffer. And if I'm suffering, he doesn't love me. And I think that's one of the one of the first things we have to reconfigure, one of the daily things we have to reconfigure. Uh, and I do think that there is a Christ, rich Christian tradition that says, uh, if I'm suffering, there may be a way in which there will be a way in which God can use this both for me and for others. I'm, I'm, I need to go look for it and try and find out what it is. And then the people around us must behave not like Job's comforters, but actually sustain us in the courage with which we engage with the suffering, which is so horrible and which we don't want. I think, Gavin, I agree with you, uh, because it is not the fact of suffering itself. It is the what you do with that suffering. Uh, I'm sure you know the yeah. topic much better than I, but I always recall Viktor Frankl's book uh, about his experiences in the concentration camps and those who lived and who died. Everybody suffered equally, uh, but those who yeah. who took their suffering and sought to find deeper meaning. Those who embraced it, yes. Uh, were those who were able to make it through. Uh, so now's a great time to take it back the, to, let's take it back to the Beatitudes. Let's take it back to the first sermon uh, of Christ, you know, where he talked about what uh, God identifies as good and righteous and pure and holy. And it's clearly those who suffer and who are downtrodden and who are poor and who are, you know, not uh, identified as the typical Western evangelical. Um, I, I'd like, if I may, to, to say uh, to take a bit of a risk and say that one of the things that I haven't understood in the Catholic tradition is when people talk about bearing suffering as, as reparation. I think that that, and I had a very strange experience once um, when I was having a bad time, and, and please forgive me for mentioning it, but it 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 it. it shifts the focus of our discussion um, I was complaining to God bitterly that, about my suffering at this particular point in my life and saying why don't you fix things it's, this is unbearable uh, I was in Tizé and I, I, I had in my mind I, I saw Jesus on the cross and actually Jesus spoke to me I know this will sound ridiculous and I apologize but but the Lord said he interrupted my complaint and he said uh, I, I understand about your suffering I wonder if you would consider bearing mine and I went, you know, excuse me, where did you come into this? This was all about how I'm not coping. <laughs> Why have you changed the subject? And he asked me to share, to come up on the cross with him. Uh, and in some strange way, it seemed to me in my imagination uh, that I found myself on the cross with him and I found myself having the most dreadful suffering. I, I fact, in fact, I, I began to count to 10 to see how long I could, could cope with it because it was just utterly appalling. And I didn't get to 10, I, at nine, I stopped and said, I can't take this, you better put me down. So he did put me down and I was shocked because I thought I was having a bad time. But for a moment, I had some very odd and strange insight into the bad time that he had had on the cross and that in some kind of way, given these very strange complexities of time and space, he was still havering, having on the cross. And there is within Christian tradition an invitation to, to allow our suffering to become sharing in the sufferings of Jesus. Indeed, St. Paul has a very interesting phrase that nobody quite understands, which is that he asks that he may suffer somehow to make up what is lacking in the sacrifice of Jesus. I've never heard a good sermon explain exactly what that means, but I think it's, it's, it's in this mysterious link between the fact that our Lord continues to suffer in some kind of way, and what he wants us to do is to use our suffering to, 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 in, to somehow engage with his, so that we, we share his suffering as he shares our suffering. This isn't masochism. This is a form of, 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 of the deepest love carrying us with courage into a place that looks terrible because we're going to come out the other side. But so I think, I think there, there are two sides to the suffering. There's our suffering, but there's his suffering and the way in which we allow these two to, to, to speak to each other for creative good, which has got something to do with holiness. My uh, fear, if you will, 
because I'm sp speaking now not an intellectual plane, but an emotional, experiential plane, is that um, w I know people who have had experiences such as you shared, and I do not denigrate them, uh, but I don't have them. I can remember being uh, 13 years old and going with my mother to a uh, uh, St. Leo's Monastery. My mother was very active in the Crisillo movement in the 70s and was part of that first renewal uh, blossoming the charismatic movement. And I being with her standing at the altar, uh, kneeling at the altar as she was praying. And my mother uh, had come out, we had moved to Florida when I was 12 because my mother was dying and my father wanted her to die in comfort. And uh, she uh, was healed uh, in a way that could not be explained by medical science at the time. And she and my father became very active in the, in the Crisillo movement in South Florida in the 70s, early 70s. And we went to St. Leo's and my mother prayed at the altar and, and I'm sitting there next to her and at one point my mother says, look at my hands. And I said, What's, what, mommy? She said, look at my hands. I have the marks of Christ on my hands. And I looked at her hands and she had nothing. In other words, he, so where I come to this is, my mother firmly believed that she was given a mystical experience of stigmata at a certain time, at a certain place, and it informed her understanding. I was sitting right next to her, I saw nothing. My response to that as I matured and tried to understand how God works is that I could only take refuge in the words of scripture. Because if I, if I settle my spiritual experiences as being the uh, way in, then I have no way to test their veracity because I'm beginning with the uh, presupposition that God has spoken to me, therefore everything must conform to how God has spoken to me. So my lack of spiritual experience lead, led me to put primacy first place on the Bible rather than on mystical or charismatic experience. So I, my, if you will, that's why explains George is a happy Protestant, why George is not <laughs> Roman Catholic in any way, shape, or form, and why, why I believe that you know the Bible is that way forward, not that personal experience. And for some reason, God has given Kevin what's called pious bias. When I hear something well, uh, out of the the reeds of Africa where somebody has been healed or something like that, my bias goes up and says, yeah, I don't think so. You know, prove it. You know, I would have been the, the ultimate uh, uh, doubting Thomas. You know, I, I, I want proof. And to encourage you uh, as viewers of this program, because of that, I have amazing faith because I've seen the proof so many times. I've seen the, the evidence, I've seen the testimonies, I've seen the miracles. Uh, I've, I've been able to watch this uh, for the 50-some uh, years of my life uh, in living color. Uh, God's working here on earth. And so I think the pious bias that uh, God has given me always to, to raise my eyebrow and say, really, I don't think so. He, he constantly uh, provides evidence for what he's done. And part of the, the, the love I have with Anglican TV is to be able to show you that in, in camera I, I love the idea of pious bias. I certainly yeah. think our first reaction to everything should be raising the eyebrow mm -hmm. and saying, really? Because we have to be, we have to say, save ourselves both from credulity and from, 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 I'm afraid, what is inevitably satanic delusion. So I'm with George absolutely about, mm -hmm. about coming at this with scripture. Anything that doesn't mirror scripture is not acceptable mm. but there is this difficult world and one of the reasons i stopped being a charismatic was precisely because i found the stress of telling the difference between madness and holiness too difficult so i became a liberal <laughs> that, was <how> I, <laughs> well, uh, that was precisely how i coped with it <laughs> but in the end i found i had to come back and find some sort of courage to try and do exactly what george has asked us to do which is to have the courage to find the difference between madness and holiness. I had a, another experience. I've been fortunate in uh, my life. Uh, in 97, I rode on a bus next to this clergyman, and I sat next to this clergyman from New Hampshire. It was the, one of the general conventions. There's a man named Gene Robinson. He was candidate of the ordinary of the diocese of New Hampshire. And we started talking, and he basically shared with me that uh, 
God was telling him, you know, God was telling him a new thing and he, about human sexuality and that we had gone through the age, time of the law, we had gone through the time of the gospel, now we were in the age of the Holy Spirit. And it was the Holy Spirit who through personal revelation that stood on the foundation of scripture that allowed Gene Robinsons to say with complete integrity that God was doing a new thing and that this is how sexual relations should be ordered. Now what I'm taking away from this is Gene Robinson in his own thinking and mind was not being motivated by his appetites. He was not looking to affirm his weaknesses, anything like that. He truly believed that God had led him to this place through an outworking and action of the Holy Spirit. If you will, Gene Robinson was a charismatic. The destination he arrived at, I could not accept. Because, but this sort of idea that we're in the age of the Spirit, that personal revelations or and I'm going to be unkind and say, and Marian apparitions, or the whole spectrum of extra scriptural things does such damage to the witness because Gene Robinson is a good man. Uh, yet, I believe well, he, he wants to be good. <laughs> yeah, but he was leading people to a bad place. If, I don't think people understand I often how, how my much. My experience is better than your experience, then we go nowhere. I don't think people understand often how much in the traditions of the church there is exactly the resistance that you and Kevin have been talking about. So for example, in the Desert Fathers, if a monk gets up and goes to the abbot and say, the Lord spoke to me, the, the abbot will say, go, go, go back and forget all about it. You've no business to come to me and say, the Lord spoke to you. I don't, I don't believe you for a moment. Um, unless this thing repeats itself, you know, time and time again, and, and you, you appear to be sane, and then William James, the, the excellent uh, um, agnostic psychologist and philosopher who, was, who read a whole book about the variety of religious experiences that many of our listeners may, may know and I used to teach in university. Um, I mean, he says, I've, you know, usually 95% of the time I have no way of knowing. But one of the very interesting things is what the fruit of this ethically is. Now, this is a very dangerous argument because, again, the whole gay culture has used this fruit argument by, by mispresenting the fruit. But nonetheless, James is, is, is right to say, if you can't tell at the outset, you'll have a very good idea some way down the road in terms of what it's produced. So for James, if somebody says, I've had a mystical experience of Jesus or of healing, he says, well, then I, I need to know your alcohol problems cured <laughs> or your anger problem or your, or your fidelity problem. I need to see something's radically changed in your life for the better if I'm going to accept this at anything like face value. But you need to know I'm starting off by not accepting it at face value. And actually, that's the tradition of the church. So with all the Marian apparitions, for example, the first thing the church says is baloney. <laughs> we're going to take a very, very long time indeed before we're willing to allow this to move any further forward. Basically, the skepticism that we start with is an insurance against madness and deception, and we really need to hang on to it tightly. What a great transition. Well, guys, we're coming up on 43 minutes, and I can't go any further in a program without talking about Pope Francis. <laughs> who has given a Christmas present to Anglican Unscripted uh, in, a, in a recent interview. You have to close your ears. <laughs> no Pope bias. Okay. Um, uh, said, said in an interview with some high schoolers that uh, you do not need to proselytize. You do not need to go out there and uh, spread the good word of God. Um, that's not the role of Roman Catholics. And in fact, if you're doing so, you're not a good Catholic. So, I, Kevin, this is very good advice. The fewer new Catholics there are, the better. <laughs> <laughs> he saw me coming or maybe like, he heard Quack. the news he, he heard the news and he said stop we don't want any more of these <laughs> people right. <laughs> yeah, that's right yeah that's right this comment you know catholics you don't do anything let let the george and his protestant gang go get all the believers <laughs> yeah. perfectly fine with that I so gavin uh yeah, so Gavin, yeah, indeed. So, so, so Gavin, <laughs> well, no, the, you, you, you asked early on, will you have a role for me on Anglican Land Scripted? Yes, I have a role for you, <laughs> as long as there's a Pope Francis. Uh, why don't you tell me the the, uh, the current theology in Roman Catholicism about uh, spreading the gospel 
and, and one where, of the things where, Pope, I've, I've, where Pope Francis may be in error. So, so <laughs> with some <laughs> advanced notice of my own journey, I've begun to follow some interesting people on Twitter for the last 12 months or so. Uh, and I've been listening to the Twitter feed. I have to say, the traditional Catholic community is absolutely outraged. They're spitting tax. They're furious, saying, if we're not about evangelism and converting people, we're about nothing. So one of the things Francis has done, uh, on purpose or not, is to engage the, a great section of the Catholic community in a huge energetic rage about the lack of evangelism. So, so that's one interesting thing, whether we don't know if it's by design. The thing about I'm discovering about Francis is, and that this is very consistent with this book called The Dictator Pope, which I, I've read and enjoyed to commend to everybody, although don't tell Francis that, um, is that is that the, the kind of the, the theology in that is that, that he's a Peronist. And one of the things that, 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 that happened in the political culture of South America was, uh, was the capacity to say two opposite things at the same time. Now, I have no idea whether he does this on purpose, but, but I'm reading, I have in front of me, we'll put the link, I hope, in the script so other people can read it. Christmas greet, his Christmas greetings to the Roman Curia uh, on Saturday the 21st of December. So it's about the same time as this thing was reported. It's just full of evangelism. It's all about mission and evangelism and the need for conversion the world, deeper conversion. I mean, you couldn't get more orthodox stuff. So I absolutely don't get how he produces stuff of this high quality, as far as I can tell. It's high quality for me. And yet he's reported by saying things. And I just wonder sometimes, uh, I mean, is he doing a Trump? <laughs> Is this part of the, you know, in the same way that Trump handles Twitter, is, is he somehow in some ingenious way engaging the church in a wonderful discussion about evangelism? I have no idea. All I can see is that we have these two things happening at once. Public things, that I, I wonder if they're sometimes being misreported or lost in translation or, or decontextualized. But at the yeah. same time, Gavin, there's evidence that, that, that orthodox faith is being lived and talked about. Gavin, would you apply this standard to Justin Welby? Because Justin Welby does as many of these things of saying one thing to one audience and one thing to another. He'll say one thing to an African audience about human sexuality, that he is firmly in the camp of those who believe in Lambeth 110, for instance. And then he gives uh, impromptu speeches at, uh, what is it, uh, that uh, green... Uh, these uh, public fe these festival uh, we knew things yes so they I, so in other words here here I uh, hear uh, you're saying perhaps Francis is misquoted Francis is misunderstood and we can only really look at his official statements no no I raised the uh, question we're going to <laughs> well be because just well be official statements and the mantra of the press office of the Church of England is that nothing has changed the prayer book is the prayer book. We can't be accused of doing new things when we haven't done it. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain because his words mean nothing. It's in the prayer books and the doctrine and discipline of the church that hasn't changed. How can we apply one standard to Welby and one to the Pope? Oh, George, that's brilliant. You should have been a, a, a lawyer. That's fantastic cross-examination. <laughs> I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm on a pin. But, but you know, I, 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 um, I have no rational answer. My instinctive answer... Uh, I, have a, I have a spiritual, emotional, instinctive answer, and that is that I have a real problem spiritually, emotionally with Justin Welby. I have a problem with the Pope, but it's not that deep, it, 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 and I can't explain the difference. Uh, I've seen Welby, well, I've seen them both, I've, I've seen more of Welby. Um, I've also heard people talk about the Pope um, having met him at length and said they found something profound and authentic there. I have heard people say nice things about Justin Welby, but, but, but not to the same extent. I'm terrified that you're leading me into a trap that we, not on purpose, but that we start at the beginning of the show where, you know, we got into the dump Trump thing. So we've, we started the show by saying, let us never um, morally judge the flawed people because, because God can use flawed people. And I'm just about to try and judge both Welby and the Pope. I, I really don't know the answer. I, I'm at least I'm not alone in being amongst those who are flummoxed by the Pope. But I don't. I'm not so flummoxed by Welby. I'm afraid. I, I'm afraid I find what what I see there. Uh, I find more congruous 
and straightforward and consistent. I have absolutely, n I'm not just saying this about St. Francis, my, because my latest um, uh, uh, change of direction. Indeed, in all the questions I've been asked by journalists and various people, the, the, you know, the most difficult one is always, so how are you with the Pope? And the answer is, <laughs> <laughs> this is really. This is not the time to convert. If you want an easy, you know, you, you, one doesn't do this for convenience. Um, under John Paul, JP two, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I don't know the answer. I, you know, with William James, I think I have to say, let's let time tell. It, we need to finish up the program. It, from my perspective, uh, Justin Welby is causing a Anglo exit. Uh, Pope Francis is causing a Rexit, a Roman Catholicism exit. Uh, I mean they're not doing the best for their brands you know that's just what i gotta say we need to finish up here uh anything before we go guys how about some nice wisdom for christmas to our well, audience? i just I just i just think we should say that neither Wellby nor nor francis are the brand i mean they're not they're just the people who happen to hold the office at the time we can't we mustn't conflate whether whether we think well of them or badly of them mm -hmm. um, we must allow the, the the brand itself to speak for itself even if it's slightly colored by who we think they are, um, but but um, so yes, we need to find a way of um, moving but, to the birth of Jesus. And it's much on, easier to make, it's much easier to make that claim if you're an Anglican, because then you believe that the church is that gathered community of faithful people, not a magisterium far away and far above. Okay, people, I'm going to have I can't possibly. I, I, I'm going to have mercy on our audience. I can't argue with you now. <laughs> yeah. Let me have mercy on our audience. You're going to take this off, off camera. <laughs> no, no. I'm going to have mercy on our audience. I'm cutting everybody short, including myself. I do want to wish most of you are going to watch this on Christmas uh, morning because by the time I use the slow internet here at the hotel to get it up, uh, it'll be uh, Christmas uh, in England uh, or Britain, I should say. So please, uh, people, have a Merry Christmas. Uh, enjoy the, the, the time with your families, the reflections you have uh, of the, the answer to Advent as it occurred today. And uh, we pray that uh, you would continue to watch this program into the, the coming time and enjoy it and be encouraged and draw closer to the Father uh, through it. I am Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. He came in to share our suffering, to let us share his, and he is going to lead us struggling and incompetent to heaven. Thank God. Hallelujah. Happy Christmas. It's either the 24th as we speak, or the 24th, 5th as you listen, and it was always episode 560. <laughs>